to digit uh, debates. Uh, we are delighted today to have with us uh, Brendan Burchell and David Frain um, talking on the resurgence of disorder working week uh, during the pandemic in the pandem pandemic. Uh, Brendan Burchell is a professor in social sciences. Um, he has led a number of major uh, projects, uh, which include projects on job quality, precarious work and employment, and lately uh, a major progress, a, a project on uh, shorter working, uh, shorter working week, um, which is uh, which was entitled "Employment Dosage," uh, looking at the relationship between well-being and shorter working week. Um, David Frain uh, is uh, also working on a similar project um, uh, with Brendan Bochel. He's a sociologist of work and uh, interested in specializing in the future of work and working time. Uh, Brendan and, and David are currently working uh, with Digit Center on, an employ on um, a project which is, uh, which is mainly on employer-led experiments with uh, shorter working week. Uh, we are very happy to have them both here, and we look forward to um, hearing uh, to uh, their presentation. Um, David, Brendan. Hi, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to share the screen, and then we'll get started. Um, if there's any technical problems or anyone can't see, um, just give me a shout. So. Um, a few weeks ago, the Labour academic Juliet Shaw spoke at the International TED conference, and she opened by saying this, she said, I've been studying work since the 1980s, and I've never seen anything like what's happening today. And she was referring to topics that have become familiar to us over the COVID pandemic, uh, job insecurity, the record numbers of people quitting their jobs. Um, but she was also referring to this huge reignition of interest uh, in the idea of working time reduction. So the idea of collective efforts, maybe on the scale of workplaces, uh, on the scale of industries, or maybe even on the scale of nations, to allow workers to have more free time. Working time reduction pilots uh, are now being conducted internationally uh, with a lot of interest from journalists. National governments in Wales and Scotland and Iceland have commissioned research on how to reduce working time on a national scale. And then we also have unions like IG Metall in Germany uh, or Forza in Ireland who were involved in working time campaigns uh, even before the pandemic. And these initiatives have been framed in all sorts of ways, um, a fight for freedom from exploitation, a health and well-being initiative, uh, or a necessary step to towards a more equal gender division of labor in the household. There's even been ecological interest in reducing work in time. And this would accommodate not only fewer hours, but maybe even a wholesale reduction in economic output, scaling back industries that cause environmental harm. So this idea has appeared in all sorts of frameworks and in all sorts of ways. But in the language of the moment, um, Working time reduction is usually expressed uh, in terms of a shorter working week or, or the demand for a four day week. And the idea is to reduce the working day, uh, the working week by one day. Uh, crucially, this would be without any loss in pay and gradually shift towards a new normal of 32 hours. And the strategy for achieving this um, would have to be very different in different industries and sectors. But the hopes of the campaign uh, are that this can eventually take place on a society-wide scale and be of benefit to everybody. Now, Brendan and I um, have both been thinking independently about the issue of working time reduction for a number of years. Uh, and now we've come together to work on a new project. And this project uh, focuses specifically on the booming interest in the shorter working week among employers. So mostly employers in the private sector. Um, I'm going to pass over to Brendan in a while, who will talk over some of the early findings, uh, things we've been hearing in interviews. Um, but first, I'm just going to make a few more remarks to set up the context. So the first relevant bit of context 
is that the roots of working time reduction go back a really long way. Um, this is not a new idea at all. This is an idea that's maybe even as old as capitalism itself. Um, we find discussions in classical texts from the likes of Marx and John Maynard Keynes, for example, who, who both looked forward to a future of radically reduced working time. And a really common theme in these early works was that this would be built partly on the capacities of technological development. So this is the classic quote that a lot of people know from Keynes, who was reflecting on the prospect of a future where productive technology and work innovation had reached a point where humans will be able to enjoy abundance, uh, but only invest a fraction of their waking lives in the process of production. He says, for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from press and economic cares, how to occupy the leisure, which science and compound interests will have won for him, to live wisely and agreeably and well. Now we know <clears throat> from contemporary research in the field of technology that the real impacts of technological development on the labor market and on labor time uh, are actually really, really complex. I'm, I'm going to try and keep it brief. Um, but we know that the development of automation-led productivity has been incredibly uneven, um, both between industries and in terms of different roles uh, within industries. Automation is more applicable in jobs that already have a predictable uh, routine element. Sometimes it eliminates jobs, sometimes it creates them. Uh, sometimes it transforms the nature of work, making the labor process more intense. Um, Digit's uh, Professor David Spencer has also emphasized that the automation of production is not this self-guiding process. It's not like a kind of runaway train uh, screaming down the rails. It's a product of deliberate investments. And sometimes these investments are appealing to, to capitalists. Machines are predictable and they don't call in sick and they don't unionize. Um, but automation investment is expensive and the incentive isn't always there. Um, if, for example, there's a strong supply of cheap human labor. Another issue is that the productivity gains of technology um, may have little to offer in the realm of domestic and care work, um, traditionally performed by women. Uh, it's notable that Keynes said that it would be man who would face the problem of leisure. Um, we have this huge segment of socially necessary labor the labor of social reproduction, which isn't always attended to in, in utopian dreams of a kind of more leisurely future. So there's lots of interesting topics to debate here, um, but the bigger point that I'm trying to pull out is that working time reductions, they don't spring up um, as a natural consequence of capitalist development. And also when productivity innovations do save time, uh, it's not clear that everybody gets to benefit from this. Um, reducing working time um, has always been dependent on uh, demands and on struggle. Um, as Lewis and Strong put it in their 2021 book, our freedom from the hardships of work is rarely, if ever, given to us. Uh, it must be demanded and it must be fought for. So there's a historical struggle between capital and labor, um, the struggle of workers to, to get a greater dividend of these gains in productivity in the form of, of more free time. And backing this up, um, what history has shown us is that working time reductions are most significant when worker power is strong. So campaigners for the four day week often like to emphasize that today's five day normality um, is itself a product of struggles. Studies of working time trends show sharp reductions in working hours in the post-war periods. And these are tied to labor organizing efforts, um, things like the 10 hour movement of the 19th century, uh, and then the eight hour movement of the 20th century, um, which is associated with Robert Owen's famous slogan, eight hours work, eight hours rest, uh, and eight hours for what we will. And because these reductions were won <clears throat> by struggle, uh, these movements were always under threat. Um, they were often followed by long plateaus in working hours, partly because working time reduction has faced opposition from the captains of industry. Um, for a classic example, we can think of Henry Ford, uh, someone who was concerned about the shorter working week. He said, 
of course, there's a humanitarian side of the shorter day and the shorter week. Uh, but dwelling on that subject is likely to get one in trouble. Uh, for then, leisure might be put before work rather than after work uh, where it belongs. And Ford represented the more orthodox economic argument, which is that the dividends of productivity shouldn't go to the worker in the form of more free time, but should instead be reinvested for expanding economic output and creating new markets. Uh, instead of opening up more free time, the economy should be directed towards continually reinventing society at higher and higher levels of material abundance. And this starts to take us towards the topic of the research that we've been doing this year at Cambridge. Um, what's striking when you think about this historical background of struggles for less work um, is the extent to which today's interest in the four day week is actually being driven a lot by employers. <clears throat> um, next week, there's going to begin a major UK pilot study of the shorter working week, which involves around 70 companies, uh, mostly from the private sector. And there are other pilots being run in the US and in Ireland and in Australasia. And they explore what we might think of as a kind of smart business perspective on the shorter working week. There's a growing network of business leaders um, who are interested in the possibility of synergies between employees' desire to have more free time and business priorities, um, things like workplace morale and productivity and uh, reputation and the ability to recruit staff and retain them and so on. And this type of interest in the shorter working week generally follows what the organization four day week global call the 180-100 model of reduced working time. So this corresponds to 100% productivity uh, in 80% of the time, that's the four day week, for 100% of the pay. So turning now towards the research that we've been doing this year, um, it goes back to 2021. Uh, the news was full of analyses around the COVID pandemic and this huge disruption to working norms. I remember the, the labor journalist, Sarah Jaffe, remarked, everybody's a labor journalist now. Everybody's talking about the future of work. And Brendan and I were talking about the potential of the pandemic to act as a kind of catalyst for the shorter working week, um, a kind of rupture with the potential to drive this idea forward. And what we've been uh, focusing on specifically is the palpable interest from employers. And we're generally interested in these kind of two high level uh, questions. One is what's motivating so many employers to try the shorter working week? Um, what are they hoping to get from it? What kinds of values and priorities do they talk about when you ask them? Um, who is driving it in the company? How did staff feel about it? And also, how is the employer-led shorter working week being implemented? Um, so what kind of changes um, and innovations and changes to the labor process are allowing this to work? Uh, can we take inspiration from these? Have things got more intense for staff? Um, what's the policy if work if the work isn't getting done. And we're approaching uh, 25 of these interviews so far um, with senior staff in companies from a variety of industries. So things like a packaging warehouse, a brewery, marketing consultancies, architecture practices, a clothing manufacturer, a mechanical parts distributor, video game studios and a salon, a housing association, um, and some already have a shorter working week and some are about to take part in a trial. And at the broadest level, we're, we're going into these interviews with what we think of as a kind of cautious optimism. So we're optimistic about the fact that working time is back on the agenda. Um, the idea that businesses are willing to challenge convention and explore this possibility is a, is a sort of encouraging and interesting moment. And we've heard inspiring things from companies who are implementing the shorter working week in quite innovative ways and also in democratic ways, really kind of paying attention to what staff want and you know, drawing on their knowledge of, of the job. Um, but it's fair to say that we're also being cautious. So as labor academics, um, I think it's our job to be a bit reserved as well about the depiction of the four day week as a scenario where the employer and the employee um, always have an, both have an equal amount to gain. 
And we may, may be seeing the elision of certain questions around conflicts of interest uh, or power. Does the version of the shorter working week that we see in represent the most inclusive kind of model? Uh, is it the most applicable to a wide variety of industries? And if it isn't, then maybe we move on to thinking about what other kinds of initiatives and actors, whether this is the role of unions or the state, um, might be needed to push this issue forward in the most progressive way. So I'll pass over to Brendan now, um, who's going to talk through some very kind of preliminary um, insights into what we've been hearing in the interviews. Yeah, so as David said, um, we've coming to the end of the interviews we did with employers that had already gone over to a reduced working time, four day week. Um, but just this week uh, has been uh, another push forward because we've started the preliminary interviews just before those uh, organizations in the trial uh, go into their working time reduction. Most of them are doing it in June, but one or two have delayed starts to July or, or later. The, so if we go to the next slide, David. Um, and the, so first of all, looking at the motivations, we've asked people where this came from, where the idea first came from, and then how the idea was um, panned out. And just to clarify, we're talking about where the whole organization or very large parts of an organization have gone over to a four day week. We're not talking about situations where individuals have decided that they want to work shorter hours, maybe where, when the organization continued with conventional hours. And to our surprise, maybe, but um, it was in, it, very much driven by employers. Employers are the ones who claim to have come up with the ideas sometimes because of the pandemic but not always sometimes they said they, it was something they were thinking of doing before the pandemic um, sometimes the, the, the pandemic gave them an idea of that things were going to be done differently sometimes it was about um, the fact that well if you can as the claims are all around be as productive in four days as five days why not do it and certainly those uh, there was a lot of talk about that that, it, that it's relatively easy. And this is again, going back to the existing business literature coming from New, Le New Zealand and elsewhere, that you can be, you can, it's relatively easy to get as much done in four days as it is in five. A lot of the talk is also about employee well-being, sometimes because they're, the employer is in a sector where they're dealing with well-being, dealing with well-being of other people outside the organisation, typically, as, for instance, caseworkers. And they're thinking, well, if we're an organisation that are prioritising well-being, it's a bit hypocritical if we don't prioritise the well-being of our employees and dealing with other people's mental health is stressful. And one way we can reduce that stress is by allowing people to work four days a week. So you get all sorts of different um, uh, motivations going forward um, to do with um, this. And, and again, one of the things that we've been struck by is just the diversity in those interviews that we've been doing. That the, the um, and even say an interview we were doing on Monday, one of the reasons they gave was to give a shake up. They, they were finding it difficult to make organizational change. And by getting people to go down to four days a week, then they would, um, it would give them that impetus to bring about the changes they want. And people had to be ready to make those changes, uh, for both for themselves and their line manager. Otherwise they wouldn't be allowed to go down to a four day week. So great diversity there. And um, yeah, so, you know, we might've, um, if there wasn't that diversity, we might've stopped doing those interviews earlier. I should say as well, it's not just David and I doing those interviews that we've brought on other people to uh, um, engage with these interviews as well, to, you know, bring in more ideas, particularly Neve Britton Hubbard, um, Diger Camerard, and Fran uh, Mullins, who, and so I think some of them at least are on this video today. So um, thanks to them as well. So moving on to the, the next slide. Then, so what is it that people are actually moving towards? And you might think, well, you know, it's what it says on the tin, it's a four day week uh, down to, you know, 20% uh, uh, reduction in working time, down to say from 40 hours to 32. Again, one of the surprises we've had is that the diversity in what people are actually doing to bring this about. The, and again, probably virtually saying of the 25 or so interviews so far, there's no or two organizations that have done exactly the same thing. In some cases, there is a contract for 
a four uh, day week that's been drawn up on the shorter working time and everything's been redesigned around that. Uh, new contracts being put in place. Sometimes it was done initially as very much a trial and it was conditional upon things working out, productivity being maintained. Sometimes they said, well, if you're gonna trust employees to do it, you just have to do it. There's no, there's no going back. Often it was done on a more informal basis, particularly in organizations where the number of hours people working was often already over their contracted hours. Um, and so exactly what had been going on, the extent to which hours would, had been changed was uh, difficult to, to know exactly. In one manufacturing company, uh, they hadn't reduced the hours at all, actually. They had worked four and a half days a week, as is typical of manufacturing in, in the north, uh, in parts of the north of England. Um, they had to now reduced down to four days. It was genuinely one of the organizations where absolutely nobody worked on Friday, but they worked nine hour days for the first four days. So that there actually wasn't a working time reduction at all. It was claimed to be very popular, but no working time reduction. In terms of pay, there were a small number of organizations that had been a loss in pay. Again, this typically was brought in as a pretty much as an emergency sort of measure during the pandemic um, when they were going to have to do something drastic like close down or put a lot of people on furlough. And so accepting a temporary loss of pay until the emergency was over was a possibility. But by and large, cuts in pay are, um, is not something we're seeing. But all this decision like making, like I say, was coming from the top. Um, they talked about often somebody in HR or the CEO having the idea first, sharing it with other managers, and then cascading it down the organization. They often talked about the, um, the, the way that maybe people thought it was too good to be true at first or couldn't believe what was happening, um, but it was that top down. There wasn't a mention of trade unions. There wasn't a mention of, of it coming from a, a grassroots level. Which again was, you know, like I say, a surprise to us given the, the, the trade union activism around this issue that David described. So, next slide. Is it as good as it says? Is it just given to employees? Um, usually, no. Usually, they expect something back in return. And if they are going to, if the employer is going to maintain productivity, then okay, number of hours is reduced but the work intensity has increased. The, they're just having to get more done in that time. The, we think they're doing it in less time. Like I say, there are some, particularly some professional workers, computer programmers, architects, in some cases, those sorts of things, where whether they're just taking more work home because they're not doing, not coming to the office on Friday, but still they're working you know, they're getting the same amount done, doing the same hours is quite possible in at least a small number of cases. One of the things that we found alarming about this was in discussing that transition, a small number of employers, again, were talking about employees had to have the right mindset to be ready to do a four day week. They had to be ready to work, you know, smart, work in a different way, possibly work with more autonomy. And again, occasionally mentioned that some of their employees weren't up to it. They weren't the right sort of person for this four day week and they had to let them go. We tried to get more details of those and they weren't very forthcoming on that, um, we have to say. But, um, the, um, but yeah, clearly we're getting the sense it doesn't suit everybody that working intensively for four days. Again, sometimes we're told it, you don't have to work Friday if you've got your work done, if you've done the work in the rest of the week, um, then, and sometimes you can, you don't have to work on Friday, but you can use Friday to plan for next week, do longer term projects, catch up on correspondence and email and those sorts of things. So again, there's some, in some cases, Friday's a different sort of day, a day when there aren't meetings, things but uh it's not clear you know again there's this fuzziness around um so we're thinking that in order to for this change to happen 
something you know really quite significant has to change you, you know it's not just a small sort of change which you can carry on as normal but we're making minor changes again the way it happens in most cases it means that everybody has the same day off typically that's friday we expected more to see rotors for different days off perhaps people working shorter days but no the dominant model is people having fridays off if they do need to cover friday another model is having uh, some people having mondays off and some people having fridays off um, again, there were other unique solutions, but some people having more occasional long weekends for everyone. Um, again, it depended on whether they were very much whether they were customer facing or whether they had to respond quickly to what was going on, say, for an architect on a building site and, and, and so on. Again, it turned out rather surprisingly that interfacing with other businesses and customers was less of a problem than we thought. Often they said when it was interfacing with other businesses that the other businesses were so in awe of them going down to four days a week, they were very happy to put up with the fact that they couldn't get, a, say, a fast response on Friday and something of that sort. In some cases, they had to be open about the fact they couldn't get people to do as much work in with reduced working time and had to hire more staff, but that was unusual. The, when we asked them, and sometimes we really had to push, said, well, if you're only working four days instead of five, or whatever the, the reduction was, as, as it was variable, there's something's got to give, you're doing less, less of something. And something was very common then, people say they cut down meetings, they didn't have such long meetings, they didn't have as many meetings, not so many people had to come to meetings. That was a, a, a very widely reported, um, reaction. Although, again, we don't have a control group, we don't know what's happened in other organisations. And again, that discussion about cutting down on meetings, being more efficient around meetings, is probably something you'd find in other organisations, but we think probably not to the same extent. In terms of the technology, the, again, quite common for people say that, again, this is often something that they started doing in the pandemic, when people got away from that idea that all employees would be working the same hours, they moved towards some sort of project management software for asynchronous working so they could better communicate internally within the organization. I'd really love to tell you about the organizations that in manufacturing had gone over to using robots and thus have been able to reduce human labor. Um, and also it would have been fascinating to share with you the uh, office workers who use of, you, by use of AI, they've been able to get rid of some of the professional workers. We didn't come across a single organization so far where there was that simple relationship between technology and working time reduction, where by the introduction of a particular technology, they've been able to um, replace human labor or didn't need to use human labor to the same extent which again, to me was a surprise. I mean, I didn't expect to see it widely, but I expect at least some organizations where we've got some clear, very clear trade-off. Again, this idea of using project management software to be more efficient, I think I've got no reason to believe there that we were seeing more of that in our sample than you would elsewhere. And this idea of pushing what you could call ancillary tasks, um, longer term development and so on to the day off. And making this distinction between days when you're you're doing what you're told to do, what you've got to do, going through the meetings, doing doing the stuff, and the days when you have more autonomy, on a Friday usually, um, again that was quite common. And again, sometimes these things went up all the way through the organisation. Again, uh, one organisation we saw recently, the CEO was clear that in this case he would have to continue working same hours as before and he expected the senior managers to do that as well he didn't think they could go down to four days and in that case they were rather surprised that some of the senior managers said no i'm signing up for it i want to work four days others didn't so again different reactions sometimes at different points in the organization next slide so what were people doing in their time off this is one of those things, like many things, we're, we're going to know a lot more about uh, as the trial goes on. We're not explicitly asking for time off data. And of course, you'll realize that one of the big limitations of what we're doing is we're only talking to employers. And very often in these interviews, we would absolutely love to be able to get an employee 
version of what's going on. And um, in some cases, we were pretty skeptical about the fact if we'd asked employees what was going on, they may well have told a whole different pattern, of, have given a different picture to employers. Again, that's, a, that's always a problem you've got when you're only looking at employers or employees in an organization. But we did ask managers what they thought their staff were doing off in their additional time off. And probably the most common set of responses around the fact that people had a longer weekend and therefore didn't have to be so intensive in turning everything around at the weekend. They could just spend more time parenting, getting ready for the next week, doing the tidying and washing and uh, cleaning, all those sorts of things. Took the stress away from having to get, you know, get ready for Monday morning. Again, another surprise was in a small number of organizations, clearly a minority, but they were very keen to take an active interest in what their employees were doing on the Friday they had off, for instance. They wanted to see them doing community-oriented virtuous activities, um, possibly taking part in community organizations, voluntary work, uh, looking after themselves better. And again, in those cases, for instance, where, and, it, and just to say, in one organization, it was almost made mandatory, you know, that people had to do something good, they had to do something good on their Friday. In another organization, the employer said that she was very concerned, clearly it got under her skin, it was a big thing, a big aggravant for her, that some of the employees were binge drinking, starting their binge drinking on Thursday night instead of Friday night, so had an extra day of, of, of binge drinking and, and then recovering with the hangover on a Friday. And she really was wondering what she, you know, to her that wasn't tolerate, couldn't be tolerated. Was she gonna to have to educate them about being healthier? Now they had this extra time and so on. So interesting, um, that, that paternalism. The, um, again, you know, I suppose one of the big challenges we've got is to, you know, if we are going to have a, a different sort of society thinking into the future, about you know where there is more leisure time what you know how we prepare society for it how we educate people to use that uh, um, the ways in which society is going to have to adapt to that additional time off next slide there you are that gives you i hope an idea and i hope we said we'd leave plenty of time for for questions um like i say we're about to go into the trial and when we do the trial we will have a lot more um um, information about whether there is genuine evidence of reduced CO2 emissions through this. Um, we'll have much better time use data and so on, but um, there you go. I think that's, I hope you found that interesting, the first taste of our results. Thank you very much, David and uh, Brendan. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to uh, turn on their um, cameras so that we can uh, see each other and we can have a more uh, a better discussion, uh, sort of face to face, I guess. Um, I would. I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, I can see already a question on the chat, so please feel free to either write questions on the chat if you don't want to ask them directly, or please, by all means, um, if you want, just raise your uh, hand, the little yellow hand, um, where you can find it in reactions, and I would be more than happy to take your question. Um, is it uh, sorry? Is the name Asher or Pericles, <laughs> which one do you prefer or which one do you go with? I'm sorry, I had difficulty unmuting and I'm happy with oh. either. I've confused the, the the profile by putting both. Ash, I'm usually Asher in Ash. professional practice, thanks. Thank um, you so much. It would be uh, very nice if you could introduce yourself. Um, so that's, you know. You know. Th thank you. I'm uh, Asher Rospliozzi. I'm a lecturer at uh, Brighton Business School, just down the road from Sussex, where this event is sort of taking place in a in a virtual way. Um, and I'm interested in digital economy. Uh, that's that's what I teach and research. And, and I was really, really interested by the findings and this sort of impetus towards a four day week. But I had some audio problems earlier on and I might have missed the clear specification but Brendan as you were talking through the sort of sample of 
the responses from managers and those who are involved in trial in four day week, it, it very much struck home with a sort of a particular sector of the economy. And I wondered how much the research is looking at those who just have four day weeks because that's what they get allocated to them on shifts, like many people in precarious industries or in uh, cer certain types of service job. Um, the intersection between class privilege and this kind of more desirable type of four day week. I guess it is true that the, the typical occupations where we're seeing those reductions tend to be uh, better paid, higher skilled, um, and yeah, more secure in their, their employment. Um, not always, there were exceptions to this. Um, and, and I suppose that's, we weren't surprised by that. We thought it would, would often be in those organizations in particular, again, because recruitment was often given as occasionally given as the, the first reason why this was done, but more often they saw it as a supplementary reason. They had had difficulties recruiting, um, recently and w would help it. So, um, and, but it's, it's difficult to see if you go to the very precarious end of the labor market, what working time reduction would look like in those situations. Because if we're looking at zero hour contracts or gig work, platform work, then of course people aren't guaranteed hours of work anyway, and are typically paid by the hour for the work they're doing. So it might in fact be easier for those individuals to by themselves reduce their working time because there isn't a standard and again I suppose the whole of the notion of it of a four-day week albeit even if that's not actually what's happening in, in many cases is that notion that you're going from a standard five-day week to a, a new standard of a four-day week in the UK we haven't been pretty good on sticking to standards anyway there's a lot of variability about people's working time but where there's no standardization at all and no guarantee in the most precarious sections of the labour market yeah people can decide themselves to work shorter hours but then you get all those problems that we're trying to avoid by the standardization then it tends to be for instance women that are going to be reducing their hours for the childcare, and then that you're going to reproduce gender inequalities and so on so that's why for us it's so important that the changes that are coming about are primarily in, led at the employer level at the organizational level um i don't know david do you want to any to add anything to that yeah it's a really good question and i like <laughs> i like your reference to uh, cool cool workers um and i think we, we would expect it to see it for the cool workers first because um those workplaces are one where there's all there's a high level of, of autonomy you know if it's creative work there's a lot of flex in the labor process and we might expect the four-day week to to be realistically achieved just through kind of sheer will but I, I think one of the things that's going to be interesting about the UK trial that's underway is that it, is the the cohort of about 70 organizations is really diverse so there's there's manufacturers in there there's tradespeople there's a kind of local housing association there's a fish and chip shop um, and what I imagine is that the in order to accomplish it um, in these kinds of workplaces there's going to have to be a much more deliberate um, Pro, uh, kind of labor process redesign. Um, so that's one of the things that interests me about the trial, I think, is, is to, to see the extent to which it can work in lots of kind of different industries and, yeah, the kind of strategies that will, will be required. Thank you. Yeah, that really, that really makes sense. I mean, my wife's yeah. a nurse and she is currently working on a four day but full pay week, uh, but it's the, that longer kind of day. Yeah. Fortunately, our employer doesn't ask whether she uses her time productively at the weekends. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Jessica, Piazna, um, I'm not sure if you would like to, if your microphone is working and we would like to ask you a question. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation. It's an excellent research project that you're undertaking. And I'm um, I'm in awe in, in, uh, in the extent of empirical evidence you're able to collect, and I really look forward to reading the published research. Uh, and what puzzles me is that you point to this employer-led nature of the recent working time reductions, and 
when it's not perhaps coming from the initiative of employees, of workers, then uh, they might not use um, or they might not implement the reduction of working time holistically, so indeed reduce their um, paid activity. And what might happen is that they will use the free time for another small job, geek, side gig, or finding another free day job really to have a seven day working week as a result. And it's been some, these are the intuitions I think that Juliet Shore already uh, shared some time ago. And now um, I come across some really anecdotes that this happened in Amazon warehouse uh, in Poland that the work week was uh, reduced by, the, uh, by Amazon. Probably it was a compressed work, uh, work week, so the long days, but workers did use it to start another activity, but there's no evidence. No one really um, tries to measure it and see whether that goes beyond one odd person. So do you have any insight? Did you come across this pattern? Perhaps low income would be um, what differentiates the behavior, the strategy of workers in their off time. Thanks. Yeah. Shall I go, Brendan? Yeah. You, yeah. Um, so I, I did speak to, I did interview a company yesterday that did specifically say that um, some of their staff were planning to use the extra day in order to seek more work. Um, they were tradespeople who were going to kind of seek more, more freelance work. So, I mean, we haven't done the analysis yet and we haven't kind of fully thought this through, but the way I'm starting to think about it is that our working time is regulated by different things so so it's it's kind of regulated by the policy of our employer um which is itself subject to you know perhaps regular you know state regulation but it's also kind of morally regulated so um we're kind of looking at what our colleagues are doing and what passes as acceptable and you know what are the kind of like ethical norms that surround working time but then there's also this financial regulation you know the amount that we work is dictated by our by economic necessity and I think an effective working time reduction policy is going to have to address all of these things. Um, and you mentioned Julia Shaw, and I think one of the things that was interesting when she did a big, big kind of TED talk on this a couple of weeks ago was she did kind of give a nod to the potential for the shorter working week to mesh with, um, you know, living wage regulations or even a universal basic income um, so that we're addressing, yeah, not only so we're addressing all the kind of things that regulate um, you know, how much people choose to work and how much freedom they have over that. So that's all I was going to say on that. Yeah. There was one employer we interviewed, I can think of, who explicitly said he would not allow his employees to yeah. work on the additional time off. <clears throat> Whether that's legally enforceable or not, I'd be interested to know. Um, but others were exacerbated the fact they couldn't um, do anything to stop their employees working longer hours. Um, and they pointed particularly to, in some Parts of the NHS, people working very long hours, um, often to send remittances back for migrant workers. Um, but yeah, again, I think it, it varies, you know, a lot. On there are some types of work where it's relatively easy to freelance, and others where others less so. Yeah. Um, I will read out the question uh, from uh, Jorge uh, Cabrita from Eurofound, uh, because unfortunately his microphone is not working. Uh, are you planning to interview workers as well? And among other things, ask them about what they are planning to do with their free time. Yes, part of the trial. Um, very much there's, there's a very large standardized questionnaire that we've given out to the employees and yeah again uh time use uh measurement of time use will be a big part of that so um yeah we will have much better data um uh, we hope that's our plans and our expectations as we go into this trial yeah and uh luke and simon uh can you also introduce yourselves please hi um I'm a PhD student from Cambridge, um, so I already know David and Brendan and some other people in the chat. Um, and I had a question relating to the, the nature of the, the work that is being done by these people, and that's already come up a little bit before, but it's something that's quite puzzling to me in the sense that um, 
it would seem intuitive to me that the more has been invested either by the employer or by society as a whole in an individual developing a certain skill set, a certain level of education, et cetera, the less likely we would want them to transition to a shorter working week. Because for instance, if you spent years training somebody to be a doctor, you kind of want to squeeze as much of that back out of them as possible in their working life. Um, and it seems almost like a, a completely counterintuitive trend to me that it seems to be the most highly skilled workers in creative industries and in intellectual industries, et cetera, that are transitioning to shorter working weeks. Whereas people who are doing jobs like cleaning and manual labor and stuff where there hasn't been much kind of uh, capital or time or whatever invested in their training are being squeezed really hard and, and um, exploited as efficiently as possible. Um, and that seems kind of strange from the point of view of, you know, if you wanted to put it in Marxist terms, um, fixed capital versus variable capital normally you, if you have a fixed amount that stays the same regardless then you want to get as much out of them as possible over over time um, in the same way that you maximize your use of machinery for instance um, so i was wondering if you had any explanation for why it is that that runs counter to what might be expected on kind of economically rational grounds in a sense Thanks. Let me. I'll. I'll start answering while David collects some thoughts and comes up with a better answer, probably. But um, no, that's interesting. The um, and of course you could make different predictions that you know in some ways people are highly paid workers have got more to lose if they're working less and or they're uh, someone's losing less. But on and uh, I suppose a counter argue from that is lots of those professions with. Um, a very high cost of education and training going into the professions, you, you see people burning out long before they get to a retirement age. And this is a big problem where we have labor shortages. And I think if people were working again, it's another prediction of four day week. And it's one of those utopian predictions, the ones that we don't have good evidence yet to say whether that's realistic or not, is that by working shorter hours, people are going to be able to work longer as well into so instead of stopping work in say the 50s as is the case with lots of medics um, and nurses they'll be able to work they'll be happy to work into their 70s and possibly with a, a flexible retirement tailing off their their working life slowly because they won't feel burnt out in the way that so many people we hear reports of are burnt out long before they you know, have at the end of a normal 40 year career but we're not saying that it, it will work in all cases. As David said, we're going in open mind. There's a lot of lot of the literature which we're reading is, you know, it's easy and everybody could do it and you just have to have the right mindset and that sort of thing. We're not saying, you know, we are going in skeptically. I think there are, will, may well be areas of the labour market that will, will have to be regulated. And again, that's one of the things that the business uh, lobby pushing for this sort of uh, working time reduction don't want to see they definitely got a mind that business leaders are the people who can best bring about change and they want trade unions and, and government to butt out um so well yeah we'll see i think you know let, ask us ask us in six months and hopefully we'll have a better answer to that sort of question well nine months give us time to analyze the data as well david yeah i don't know if i have a clear answer but it's a really interesting observation i think will has the best answer in the chat actually so maybe it's partly about being able to afford to work less. Um, maybe this isn't the way that people in themselves kind of make choices. Um, people don't necessarily make that choice about, yeah, maximizing returns on skills investment. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting observation. I think we want to think about um, maybe just in practical policy terms as well. I mean, it's, it's the kind of high, the, the kind of long-term investment of skills in something like being a doctor, um, again, would require a very different strategy in terms of a shorter working week. This is where we kind of see the limits of like employer led initiatives and kind of reforms to the labor process. We don't want to work doctors any harder. So this is an area where we then have to maybe think about the state, um, you know, funding for kind of training and kind of boosting recruitment in the NHS, which is an area that clearly could do with a shorter working week, but also one where it's just a much more longer kind of term challenge. But yeah, it doesn't really answer your question, but I think it's a really interesting one that we'll keep yeah. thinking about. Yeah. The other thing that we've been speculating on <laughs> is that 
again, you know, the work of Jay Gashuni and others has been suggesting that one of the ways in which you show that you're high status in our society is by working long hours. It shows you're an important person being, being very busy. And that's a change. That's a 20th century thing. It wasn't there in the 19th century. Maybe we're starting to see a, another reversal in that. And if to show that you are the model worker, you're somebody who can get your work done in four days and you don't have to be working evenings and weekends and Fridays. And if that if we are getting that change in people's work ethic, mindset, whatever you call it, maybe that's going to be a, a very powerful force for change. Simon, I think we have time for one short question as well. Oh, my question is not short. The, um, uh, yeah, just on that last one, I mean, it, the status associated with working long hours unless you're French or something. So there's there's not just a there's not just a century kind of mode modality to this. There's also cultural and geographical issues. But I think just on the and also on the, the doctors and the other professionals, I mean you've got to take into account class there as well, because it's not a surprise that the best jobs have the best hours and the best as well as the best pay um, quite often. Just, I just wanted to make a couple of observations on the talk, which I thought raised a whole bunch of really interesting things. But just wanted to, some thoughts on how to disentangle some of them. I mean, I think the first thing is I, 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 I don't recognise the idea that Marx thought there'll be reductions in the working week. I mean, he argued that technology would reduce socially necessary labour time. But he distinguished that from actual working time and surplus labour time. So there's no there's no argument in Marx at all that the working week will, will get shorter because of because of technology. Um, just uh, I think there just so two things on the idea that it's employer driven. I mean, I think it, oh, you've also got some really interesting cases, but because of what David said about the normative aspect of working weeks uh, and the uh, you know, so there's a there's a current thing about the four day working week, but actually working hours have been under discussion for for a long time. So there's like in lots of manufacturing, in lots of continuous service industries, shift rotors. I mean, I you know the, the famous four four on four off, all kinds of uh, shift patterns that people have done for a very long time, which don't necessarily in hospitals in factories and so on which don't necessarily add up to a short working week so i think so and they've been collectively bargained for a long time so there's this has been around for quite a long time these things there's also some really interesting stuff on employers and the shift to the from the 10 hour week to the eight hour week uh, so a 10 hour day to the eight hour day in the in the 1890s and so on uh, when the employers realized that no one did any work for the first two hours basically um, but uh, uh, and the other thing I just so I think on the, the exam the variation you gave in your sample I just need think you some cares needed because a compressed working week doing your same hours in four days isn't really a shorter working week I think it's that's not the same as a re actual reduction in hours so it, the the big literature on working week in industrial relations would would make a, an important distinction between the same hours in a different number of days and uh, the actual reduction in the number of working hours. Um, uh, yeah, so I, so I think it's kind of disentangling some of those will be helpful in analytical terms. I mean, it'd be really not when you've got it'd be really nice to see a survey on some of this stuff, how these fit together with different types, different sectors, different industries, and so on. Um, but anyway, that's just some thoughts. Do you want to go first, Matt? Oh, sorry. No, no, I want you to go first. You want me to go first? Um, so the, the compressed hours, uh, yeah, certainly we don't um, see that as a shorter working week. It's not how the campaigns would define it. Um, the reason it was interesting to us is because we put out a call for participants in which we described a shorter working week. Um, and what was interesting was that the, this company self-identified as having a shorter working week, even though they were only doing compressed hours. So I think that's the that's the kind of interesting finding um, is that all sorts of situations and uh, companies in all sorts of situations are kind of identifying under this umbrella, um, as problematic as that might be. Um, yeah, 
Mark's not predicting a reduction of the working week. Yeah, maybe slightly clumsy phrasing on my part, I think. Um, the idea that Mark saw uh, this as a kind of latent possibility of technological development, but it would have to be demanded. Um, and it doesn't always come about because, um, yeah, the dividends of productivity gains are not equally distributed. They're kind of reappropriated in the form of, um, you know, more production, the creation of new industries. So, yeah, maybe the need for a little more care around the phrase in there. Um, Brendan? Um, no, yeah, lots of good points there. Um, well made, Simon. Thanks very much. No, I don't have anything to add. Uh, Perfect. Um, there are a couple of more questions on the uh, chat, which unfortunately, due to time, we cannot take at the moment. Uh, they're quite quite lengthy as well uh, and more short for discussion. But I would urge uh, people to contact you if they have additional questions. Uh, would that be OK, uh, David, Brendan, um, if they have further questions or if they would like to yeah. uh, ask cool. some um, uh, to discuss some, some issues um, discussed today further. Uh, I would also like to ask everyone to uh, give us some feedback if possible. There is a very, very, very short uh, survey right now taking place. So please, if you can um, respond to these two questions and give us some feedback, that would be amazing. Um, I would like to uh, thank David and Brendan for the uh, presentation for the uh, digit debates today. Uh, I would also like to thank all of you for um, being here today, and I would like to thank, we would like to thank um, ESRC uh, who uh, made these uh, sessions uh, real and uh, uh, who made these events possible. Uh, as you can see here, there is um, another debate uh, in two weeks time, not next week, if I'm not wrong. Let me just check my, yeah, it is in, it is in two weeks time. Um, Dimitra Petraki and Zahira Jatser um, will be talking on automating job interviews um, and experiences and implications for job seekers. Uh, we would love to see everyone um, there as well. Thank you so much and hope you enjoyed. Thank you.